here. David here. Zikowski here. Super here. Chandler here. Uh, approval of minutes from way back on December 11th. Will everybody please take a look and see if there's any omissions, corrections, comments, or questions? I have a correction. Page two at the bottom. It should be 24 7 and not 27 7. I don't know. Very last. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Fred. Um, when you guys are satisfied, we'll entertain a motion. Seifert moves to approve the minutes of December 11th, 2018. Wisikowski, you'll second. Roll call. Hannah, aye. Johnston, aye. Earl, aye. Mark abstains. David, aye. Wisikowski, aye. Seifert, aye. Chandler abstains. Okay. Uh, before we move on to significant common council, council actions, I'd like to wish you all a happy new year. Look forward to a good, happy, prosperous, safe year. And to our staff, Happy New Year. Hope you guys had a good holiday on the break there. So with that, uh, Carrie, will you give us significant common council actions? Council approved the following on December 18th, an ordinance to amend the conditions and restrictions in Ordinance 2904 to allow a parking setback of 30 feet to the right-of-way as part of the conditional use permit for an animal boarding kennel dog daycare facility with outdoor exercise area at 8411 South Liberty Lane, a proposal by the City of Oak Creek to amend the official map for a portion of the northeast quarter of Section 28, and that's the north-south East Robert Road to East Oak, Creek, East Oak Lane and west to east East Oak Lane to Shepherd Avenue mapped unimproved rights-of-way affecting the property at 10,025 South Shepherd Avenue. Also, a resolution approving the updated Abenshine Park Master Plan. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, yeah, we are getting some feedback off the mic. Hopefully it doesn't bother the recording. But um, anyways, on to new business. Item 5A is uh, consideration of conditions and restrictions for a request by Sam Dickman, Real Estate LLC, for a conditional use for a freight yard terminal and outdoor storage of vehicles and equipment at 7221 South. All right. And commissioners may recall that the proposal was for freight yard, freight terminal, and transshipment depot and outdoor storage of vehicles and equipment on the property. This was recommended for approval at the December 11th meeting. And if you turn your attention to the conditions and restrictions, H2 of 6 has site use and site and use restrictions, maintenance, and operation requirements under Section 3. This is particular to this property. No parking or storage of vehicles, equipment, merchandise, parts, or supplies within the designated public and employee parking areas. Outdoor storage shall be limited to the parking of trucks and trailers associated with the business and shall be located within the fenced area in designated and striped stalls. There shall be no outdoor storage of unlicensed or non-operational vehicles. Any change to the occupancy of the site or building shall conform to all building, fire, and municipal code requirements as amended. And the rest is pretty much standard for these conditions and restrictions. Parking is to be in accordance with code. If you turn to page 3 of 6, the duration of the conditional use permit. This is a consideration for the conditional use permit to be limited to a duration of 10 years from the date of issuance of the conditional use permit. So that would be council approval. At that time, the owner may apply for an extension of the con conditional use permit through the conditional use permit requirements at the time. If the plan commission is satisfied with these conditions and restrictions, there is a motion that has been provided, a suggested motion that says that the plan commission recommends that the Common Council adopts the conditions and restrictions as part of the conditional use permit for a freight yard, freight terminal, transshipment depot, and outdoor storage of vehicles and equipment on the property at 7221 South 10th Street after a public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, before we 
uh, put it out to the commission. Does the applicant have anything to say, or you just want to wait and see if there's questions? Okay. Uh, we'll put it up for questions for the commission. I have Fred? one question. How do we come up with the 10 years for the uh, additional permit use? That was a re um, kind of a jumping off point for plan commission to consider at this time. Um, you'll recall that the conditional use permit that was recently reviewed for 27th Street for a, kind of the same trucking operation was recommended for a six-year time span. So this is kind of an, an opportunity for the Plan Commission to have a discussion about whether or not the time frame of 10 years is appropriate or if you feel that that should be amended at any point. Is this right, Christina? Anything? I was just going to comment. I kind of like had the same question, similar, and I would recommend starting with five, and everything goes along, and they kind of follow the restriction. I would start with five from now, and they can come back and later on if there is. Ryan, anything? Don? <coughs> Greg? Thank you, Chris. Darcy? Um, you know, I'll comment. I mean, this is pretty standard what they're doing. Um, I kind of disagree with the five year. I don't think we need to have an applicant come back every five years. They may still be establishing business and whatever, but at the 10 year mark, you may want to take a look at it. Um, and, and we've had it numerous times in the city. Carrie cited one example, but we've also had some, some brown properties that the conditional use carried with it. And there could be better uses for the property, possibly if the conditional use permit had to be brought back up, the city would, for lack of a better word, be able to um, persuade businesses to do better improvements to it based upon the approval of the conditional use permit. So I, I would favor the 10-year rule on this one myself. And, and that's why I wouldn't keep it short at five. Um, we did do seven, as Carrie said. I think 10's maybe the benchmark. Maybe. Um, kind of a trial and error. but. Uh, what we're really trying to do is look out for the future of the city down the road because nobody has a crystal ball as to what's going to happen. <clears throat> um, discussion on it? Anything? Anybody? Okay. Uh, seeing none, motion, please. If I could get some oh, clarification I'm sorry. though, is the plan commission recommending that that section be changed to a different time frame or are we going to recommend 10 years? 10 years. 10 years. Okay, thank you. Motion, please. Super moves that the plan commission recommends that the common council adopt the conditions and restrictions as part of a conditional use permit for a freight yard, freight terminal, transshipment, depot, and outdoor storage of vehicles and equipment on the property at 7221 South 10th Street after a public hearing. Chandler seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Dunstan, aye. Rillo, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Wiesikowski, aye. Seaford, aye. Chandler, aye. Okay. Uh, 5B is a um, review of a final subdivision plot uh, submitted by Wolf Korndorfer East Brook LLC for the proposed East Brook Preserve subdivision located at 9349 South Nicholson Road and 1200 East Ryan Road. Uh, very exciting. New subdivision. Carrie. Proposal is for the final plat for phase one. The preliminary plat was approved in July of 2017. So the two properties are affected in red on the screen right now. Only a portion of the northern parcel is included in phase one. Loading very slowly, this is the preliminary plat that was approved. And this is the proposed final plat. They're pretty similar. Phase one has 32 new single family lots. Outlots for stormwater, floodplain, and conservation are also included on the plat. Outlots three through six are to be converted to building lots at a later time. They are currently working through floodplain issues. East Golden Lane is extended to a cul de sac to the west, and new public streets, Arbor Creek Drive, and Maple View Drive are also included in the plat. Existing structures on lot 13 will remain and all other structures will be removed as noted on the plat. So you will also see that there in the suggested motion there are a few conditions of approval. We have since received 
updates that address most of these conditions. So um, actually, number two and number three have been incorporated, and Commissioner Johnston has number one been yes, fulfilled. Yes, take care of all. So actually, only condition number four is valid at this point. So if the plan commission is satisfied with the submitted plat, there is a suggested motion that the plan commission recommends to the Common Council that the final plat for East Brook Preserve Phase 1, submitted by Wolf Corndor for East Brook LLC, be approved subject to condition 1, which used to be condition 4. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, we shall open it up to commission. Rossi? Fred's still browsing. I'll give you a little time. <laughs> thinking, thinking. Uh, Chris, anything? No, I have no questions on this. No. Greg, you guys take your time. I know quite a bit to look at. Brian, anything? Uh, Just a general comment. Um, this subdivision, it's obviously all complete. Um, there is a building pad that's staked out already. As soon as this can get approved by the state and council, We'll have a building permit ready to go and start building out here. Um, street lighting is not installed yet on this. Um, we're working through that. All the bases are in, conduits in. It's just everything has been back ordered, so that's kind of a glitch in that and hold up on that. But uh, continuing on phase two with uh, construction here, so the developer is still here and interested in the project. So. Anything? Yeah, just one question for clarification. All access for this subdivision is off the side road of Nicholson? Uh, no access on the right? Both ends, correct. Uh, yes. Well, actually, there'll be three entrances, if I'm, if I'm reading correct. this correctly. Yeah, but not yes. All right. One of the public streets is already there. It'll just be extended to that cul-de-sac to the west. And then there's a north-south proposed road and another access off of Nicholson that runs east-west. There is no access to Ryan Road. Uh, while everybody's looking, Carrie, I'm, I'm kind of just scoping out the outlots to get re familiarized with this. I see, I see the first one at the northernmost entrance, the triangle, and then at the end of, I guess I'm in phase two. Oh, wait, I'm in phase three. No. I'm not right. Are there four outlots in this phase? There's actually six, but three of them were, are proposed to be converted to building lots at a later time. So, like outlot five looks rather large. Is that, is that one that has water uh, wetlands issues? So. We have someone come to the mic who might yeah, be able to answer like that it. quicker so than name I can. And address, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, Dave Tanner with Corndor for Homes, 7900 Durand Avenue, Sturdivant. Um, thanks so much for uh, taking up this action item this evening. Um, first off, just want to say we're you know, very excited about getting going out here with some construction. As uh, Brian mentioned, there's uh, one house staked out, but in fact, um, and we have probably about 10 or so that are pretty much ready to go. A couple might uh, want to wait until spring. To get started, um, in addition, Corndor for Homes is planning a, a model on Lot 24. So we want to uh, have it as a you know, fully furnished, decorated model uh, that we can showcase and, and have open, um, you know, hopefully by sometime in August, uh, September at the latest. And then um, obviously plan to keep that model as this is a two-phase project. And uh, we think it'll be a just, you know, really amazing development. We're excited about not only the homes that will be going in, but um, also we have a uh, entry feature planned as well. They've started that by um, Nicholson. Uh, there's some uh, stone uh, piers that are going up and then uh, additional fencing going in and uh, some landscaping in the spring. So we're really trying to create that high-end sense of entry uh, to the neighborhood. And, um, you know, we think having the model out there will definitely help to uh, increase, uh, you know, some of the uh, values because I think the model we're planning is at about 725000 right now. <sighs> A ranch home with a fully uh, furnished uh, basement. Um, so it's, it's it's gorgeous out there. I don't know if you've been out there yet, but the gorgeous uh, views, uh, open space, backing up to the Oak Creek. And uh, our partner, Carrick Homes, also has um, a number of uh, buyers that are ready to go. Uh, 
in reference to the outlots, um, yeah, there are actually four. Um, everything's graded, preset. Um, we're just waiting on the final certification from FEMA before we can officially uh, build uh, on those lots. And we would come back to the city at that point and uh, work out the um, final replatting or CSM to make them officially buildable. I also want to add that I've developed in probably 15 different communities, and uh, working with Oak Creek has been fantastic, not only uh, uh, plan commission, and, but also the council and, and staff. We've had a great experience, um, which isn't always the case in development, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I know early on we kind of reconfigured. and How many total lots did you come out with in Oak Creek? We have uh, 73 total sites, uh, one existing home, so 72 new home sites but from start to finish the process has been very smooth and um, we appreciate that as a as a developer and uh, property owner uh, any questions while at the podium uh, Fred I have a question about Arbor Creek Drive in your first phase Did that stop right there the road does it continue or is are you Stopping right at that point while you're developing this. It looks like the road just comes to an end. Here, and if I can. I, I can answer that yes, for you, Fred. Please. Um, phase one, that road stops currently right there. The road is graded for phase two already. Um, sanitary and water construction is supposed to start here in January sometime. So and that's going to get finished in the near future. But currently, you're it, to have a dead end. Yep. <clears throat> for a while, till you've got phase one complete, you may want to do something on that. And we're trying to make it a seamless uh, transition. Uh, we feel there's enough market demand in Oak Creek, and so um, not only to have ready sites for um, the end of 2019 in phase two, but also just to control construction costs. Uh, given where things are going, we made the decision to keep going from basically phase one to phase two. So we'll be back in front of the plan commission and council sometime uh, maybe second or third quarter uh, for the uh, final plat approval there. Okay. Um, I guess the only questions, Carrie, I hate to do this to you. Can you run over the conditions and restrictions again? Because you said the only one that was pertinent was four at this time. Yes. All the other conditions that were recommended for approval, one through three, have been fulfilled in some regard. So we've received the information that was needed for condition number two. We received the information that was needed to fill, fulfill condition number three. And as Brian stated earlier, there's just some back orders on the street lighting, so that's not need, needed for an escrow at this time. So the only condition that's at, pertinent right now is condition number four. Thank you for that clarification. I just didn't catch it. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Greg, I just have one quick question. Um, what's labeled as outlot two? It looks like a little portion in the cul-de-sac. Is that landscape? It is. Yes. Then is there a homeowners association that maintains that, or yes? Yeah, the homeowners association will maintain not only that outlot, but also the uh, any stormwater areas, and then uh, also the entry monuments and landscaping uh, off of Nicholson. The rest of the outlots uh, will come developers. As, as they're setting to be mowed and that kind of thing? Yes, they will still be under developer ownership until such time as they can get the FEMA approvals so that they can become building lots, in which case, as was previously mentioned, they'll come back to us for that approval. Okay, thank you. I'm hoping to be back for that in late spring, early summer at the latest. Okay. Well, that'd be great. Okay, um, there's no other questions. Motion, please. Clerk moves that the plan commission recommend to the common council that the final plat for East Brook Preserve Phase One, submitted by Wolf Corn Doer for East Brook LLC, be approved with the following conditions: Number one, that any technical corrections, including but not limited to spelling errors, minor coordinate geometry corrections, and corrections required for compliance with the municipal code and Wisconsin statutes, are made prior to recording. Rupert seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnston, aye. Rillo, aye. Lorik, aye. Gave a chai.
Zagalski Eye. Sleeper Eye. Chandler Eye. Okay. Um, item 5C is temporary use permit uh, submitted by David Tanner of Corndor for Homes for a temporary sales center located at 9349 South Nicholson. Uh, Pete's got it. Yep, I will take this one. As part of the development of the subdivision, the applicant is requesting the operation of a sales trailer on one of the outlets as identified in the report. It's shown up on the screen here. It's outlet number six right on the corner. <clears throat> They'll, they are looking to remove this once they have constructed the model home that the applicant mentioned at their earlier agenda item, which then they will run their sales office out of that. But at this point, the applicant is requesting the permit be allowed for ne the next nine months. Hours of operation will be seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., which will be open to the public. The office trailer does have electric service and does have restrooms for staff and clients. They are proposing one sign, a three by four foot sign, That'll be located on site along with in front of the trailer. This isn't anything uh, precedent setting. We've done this in other subdivisions. Uh, I think the most recent might have been uh, the condominium Colonial Woods had one as part of their development as they were going forward with build out. Uh, one of the things I did include as part of the conditions of approval is number three, which says that signage will be limited to one two sided three foot by four foot sign located in front of the sales center. Airborne signs such as streamers, pennants, flags, or inflatable signs are prohibited. Uh, we did have issues with some sales trailers in other locations. And, you know, maybe in the beginning when there isn't any houses and people living there, it's kind of, okay, look and see me. But once you move in, you really don't, I don't think that the residents want to see the big inflatable Gumby guy letting him know that lots are for sale. So with that said, staff, has a suggested motion that the plan commission approve a temporary use permit for the temporary sales center with conditions one through three. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Pete. Um, questions concerning the sales trailer? Oh, no. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, Pete, I know they got the one side. This trailer won't sit right on Nicholson. Though. It'll be a few lots in, correct? No, if you take a look on, the, on your screen, there's a, a star. See if my cursor matches my monitor here. Uh, it's right. At, it, it's you know four lots in into the subdivision. Okay. So yeah, it's not going to be on Nicholson. It'll be located in middle of phase one. Signage will set off Nicholson. No, no. The signage will be on that outlet that they're proposing a sales center. Okay. So yeah. I think the people who are interested are going to drive to drive that sales through, center. And you think you're going to get it that way? And, and then hopefully, you know, as soon as they can get that first model home constructed and occupied. They will actually remove this trailer and then operate their sales office out of the new home. Gotcha. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, motion, please. Lord. Oh. Lord moves that the plan commission approve a temporary use permit for the temporary sales center with the following conditions. Number one, hours of operation will be from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m., seven days a week. Number two, Permit is valid January 9th, 2019 through October 9th, 2019. And number three, signage will be limited to one two-sided three-foot by four-foot sign located in front of the sales center. Airborne signs such as streamers, pennants, flags, or inflatable signs are prohibited. Three for seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnson, aye. Bill, aye. Lark, aye. David, aye. Zikalski, aye. Sleeper die. Chandler I. Okay, next we have uh, planned you. unit development amendment. Uh, this is 5D. Uh, to review the planned unit development ordinance uh, for the target corporation for the property at 8989 South Howell Avenue. Sorry. My connection got kicked off, so hang on a second. Second. All right. So this proposal is related to the plan unit development that includes both the target parcel, um, the TCF bank parcel, and the um, Panera Bread multi-tenant building on the corner there. But the proposal is specific to target only. 
what Target is hoping to do is update their elevations on their, on their store. So they've submitted a couple of elevations showing what is um, proposed. Some of those things include exterior building modifications and some have to do with signs. So the specific requests are for a revision to section 5C of the existing conditions and restrictions to allow for the use of additional exterior building materials. Currently, the PUD states that the facade of a manufacturing, commercial, or office building shall be finished with an aesthetically pleasing material, and their total exterior wall surface shall be finished with glass, brick, or decorative masonry materials. So this doesn't actually allow them to use any other materials. No fiber cement, no EFIS, no other decorative um, types of material other than masonry and glass. Um, and as you can see by the elevations, what they would like to do is add some decorative red EFIS. Um, also, there is a revision to Section 8B to allow for an increase to the maximum square footage on the east elevation of the building for signs. They are currently limited to a maximum of, of 216 square feet. They would also need a revision to allow for additional wall signs on the east and west eleva elevations of the building. They are currently only allowed one on the east elevation, and they're specifically prohibited on the north elevation. There's also a CVS pharmacy sign that's on the east elevation, so they're asking for one more in addition to the Target logo, that pharmacy sign, and then there, there would be a third. Now, code restrictions say that wall signs shall be no more than 100 square feet for buildings less than 300 feet from the right-of-way or 200 square feet for buildings more than, <laughs> excuse me, 300 feet from the street or interstate right-of-way. So the building itself is more than 800 feet away from Howell Avenue, so what they're proposing would fit within that restriction um, for, for distance, but we would be asking for additional square footage overall. Uh, what they're proposing is to remove the existing bullseye sign and replace it with a 196 square foot sign. However, the two other signs would bring them over that 216 square feet currently allowed by the PUD. Wall signs shall not exceed 10 feet in height. Again, per the PUD, they're allowing more than 10 feet in height for the sign. And then wall signs shall not extend above the roof line of the structure. Again, the existing bullseye does extend above that roof line slightly. Finally, the code does say that single and two tenant buildings are allowed one compliant wall sign per tenant per street frontage. So this would allow additional signage to be considered. Now keep in mind that plan commission allowing these plan unit development amendments does not approve automatically what's being proposed. It only allows them to move forward with the proposal, which would come back before the Plan Commission for final review. So the proposed conditions and restrictions, if you turn to the back of your packet, they're a little bit different than what was in the original, just updated a little bit for um, our current style. We've added the legal description. Note that this, again, only con um, these proposals are limited to the target parcel, so it's not for the entire PUD. So all requirements of the City of Oak Creek Municipal Code as amended are in effect. That's standard for every condition and restriction in the city. And then all requirements of the conditions and restrictions approved as part of that original PUD ordinance are in effect except for those that are specifically amended in these proposed conditions and restrictions. So if you turn to page five of nine, what we are proposing, instead of their total exterior wall surface shall be finished with glass, brick, or decorative masonry under 6C, we are proposing a minimum of 75% of the visible perimeter of the building at 8989 South Howell Avenue shall be finished with an acceptable glass, brick, or decorative masonry material. For all other buildings, the total exterior wall surface shall be finished with glass, brick, or decorative masonry material. If you turn to page 7 of 9, under 9B for the signs, wall signage on the main target parcel 
may be a maximum of 216 feet on the east elevation of the building. No wall signage is permitted on the north elevation of the building facing a residential zoning district. That's what it currently says. We are proposing the following language. Wall signage on the principal building at 8989 South Howell Avenue, which is Target, shall be limited to the following. One primary logo sign not to exceed 200 square feet in area on the east elevation. One secondary pharmacy sign, which is existing, not to exceed 36 square feet in area. One primary logo sign not to exceed 144 square feet in area on the west elevation. If approved by the Plan Commission through the required sign appeal process, one additional secondary sign related to the principal business not to exceed 25 square feet may be allowed on the east elevation. No wall signage is permitted on the north elevation of the building facing a residential zoning district. All signs shall comply with review requirements in accordance with applicable code sections. And then finally, Section 13, Violations and Penalties, Revocation under Section 14, and Acknowledgement under Section 15. Those are standard things that we now require that weren't part of the original PUD, but that's an implied thing that everything has to, everybody has to comply with those anyway. Those are the proposed modifications. If the Plan Commission is satisfied with those proposals, there is a suggested motion that the Plan Commission recommends that the Common Council approve the planned unit development amendments for the property at 8989 South Hell Avenue after a public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we may have questions on this one. Looks like Chaucey is ready to go. The applicant available. Uh, Kevin Nowak, I'm with Kimley Horn and Associates at 1001 Warrenville Road. Can you provide a little more information on the purpose to the increased square footage? Yeah, so Target is going, they're undergoing a national rebranding movement. Um, a lot of their stores are, are seeing similar changes and they really just want to see this consistency throughout all of their stores throughout the nation. Um, so they're really just undergoing that rebranding. Um, they want to be clear. That's why they're adding that additional sign on the west elevation as well. They want to make sure to get as much exposure as possible. So what additional items will be located in the store for the additional square footage? Is it additional on the inside of the store? I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood the question. Just the increased signage, was that your question? Oh. No, not the signage, the square um, footage of the actual building. I that can answer that, Commissioner Chandler. They're not asking for an additional, in addition to the building. They're only asking for additional signage, uh, so the square footage is, is in relation to the signage request. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So since we're talking about signs, can you provide a little more information on why the need for the additional signs? And I believe that's on the west side of the building, because that will be new. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, it's because of that Aspen Road that you see to the west. We feel like um, with that traffic, that will just offer an increased exposure for Target, um, just so they can, they can be seen more uh, easily and readily. Thank you. It's still thinking. Thanks, sir. Nothing. Chris? Okay. Um, with regards to the sign on the west, is that planned to be a lit sign? Or just a, is it going to be lit, or is it just a white target? Just, just a white target. I do have a question, actually. How is this going to impact the sign outside on Howell? Like, there's a target sign outside? Oh, the, the big pylon monument yeah. sign? That should remain the same. So no changes there? Correct. Because it's, maybe I'm misunderstanding. You're trying to rebrand or kind of make some changes to the outside of the... Right. It's more of a refreshment, I okay. guess. Yeah. But it's going to be the same look. Yes. Just maybe different colors here and there. Right. And, and typically they're using less target letters and they're more of the bullseyes. Colin, anything? Brian? Uh, from my perspective, really nothing either. Uh, I think he summed it up best. It's really just a refreshment. Uh, I suspect we're going to see more and more of this as on online retailers become more popular. Brick and mortars are going to be refreshing their image. 
And again, like he said, less letters and more just emblems for, you know, that are universal that they can relate to. So um, I don't see a problem with it. I actually think there's an advantage to having CVS out there because I'm in there all the time. I didn't know that was CVS. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and again, uh, no provisions for Starbucks. They didn't ask for it. No. They're, lo they're interlocated too. Yeah, not at this time anyways. Uh, okay. We'd cross that bridge when it comes up. I stink either. I probably shouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> um, but anyways, I don't have a problem with it at all. So if not, motion. Mr. Kelsey, you to make a motion uh, to recommend to the Common Council to approve the planned unit development amendments for the property at 8989 South Howell Avenue. Paper seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnson, aye. Trillo, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Krzykowski, aye. Seepert, aye. Chandler, aye. Uh, item 5E is a review of site, landscape, and lighting and related plans submitted by Aldi's for an addition to the exterior modifications for the existing building, 6810 South 27th. It's like another remodel or addition. Yes, the proposal is for a 1,930-square-foot addition and exterior modifications to the existing building. The addition will actually be on the north elevation wrapping around to the west elevation. So this is what the site plan shows. It's a little bit difficult to read, but what they are going to do is add on to the north, and then that will affect um, their parking lot slightly. So they will have to restripe. They're also going to, I believe, re-asphalt some of the um, parking lot, but some of the... Um, handicap parking stalls will be relocated. And I believe that is located on uh, this site plan, which is your dimension and paving plan. So it shows that addition and how those parking stalls will be um, restriped and moved a little bit to the north. There will be some slight modifications that will occur to the landscaping plan. They are mostly adding in um, for that restriping and the reconfiguration of the parking lot. And a little bit of the perimeter will also see some additional landscaping. This is what the floor plan is looking like. It incorporates both the addition and the existing. So I'm going to zoom in here so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about here. The addition is this portion on the west. Let's see if my cursor will move. There it is. So the, there's going to be an office component, um, interior space beyond the checkout lanes, and then a new entry vestibule. You'll also notice that there is going to be a cart storage area on the north and west. This is covered and incorporated into the proposed architecture. So the disabled parking stalls will be relocated and striping and utility relocation will also be uh, part of those other site changes. There's two, two parking stalls that will be a net loss. However, there's no new employees that are anticipated with this addition, no changes to the existing hours. So they've stated that the proposed number of parking stalls is actually quite sufficient for what they have in terms of customers and employees. So if we turn now to the elevations of the building, there was a slight change, um, just incorporating a little bit more information for the plan commission. So you should all have an updated elevation sheet, but what I'm looking at here on the screen, both the proposed and the existing, so you can get an idea of what the changes will be. Now, if we look at the west elevation, that's the side that's facing 27th Street. What's existing is on the, on the bottom, um, which is just black and white. The color is what's proposed. So they're going to change that tower entry element a bit. And again, you'll see that covered cart storage that's on the west side here. The proposed materials include brick to match the existing building, and then contrasting brick columns, that's that gray color. Aluminum composite panel and fiber cement panels, as well as storefront glazing. Now, per code, the use of fiber cement products requires a three-quarter majority approval of the plan commission. And additionally, code requires that a uh, minimum of 75% of the visible perimeter be finished with glass, brick, or decorative masonry. However, as with all proposed usage of fiber cement in the city, it's up to the plan commission to determine whether or not 
that type of material satisfies that um, 75% brick masonry decorative glass requirement. There are no new rooftop units or other mechanicals that have been proposed. If there are any that are needed, they will need to be screened. Um, the other portion of this proposal uh, that you need to be aware of is the fact that this is located in an overlay district for 27th Street. The re regional retail um, overlay district pro prohibits metallic features or colors. And uh, if you can tell uh, from the color, <laughs> excuse me, elevations, some of the panels are metallic in color, and uh, that's something that you'll need to consider. Now, you may recall that we did amend the overlay district to allow the plan commission to, by three-quarter majority approval, amend the, um, the building materials for an addition. But you have to have supplemental design elements or improvements incorporated into the overall plan which are over and above those which would other otherwise be required by code. So that would compensate for the modification of the standard, meaning something has to be incorporated into these plans other than what's just required in order to grant a modification to allow for the metal or the metallic feature. Um, it's up to the plan commission to determine whether or not what's been proposed is satisfactory and therefore fulfills the three-quarter, or I'm sorry, the modification request. Um, if you require more, that would be something that you would need to uh, address with the applicant at this time. So um, again, with the updated elevations that are at your stations and now on the screen, we see what was missing, which was the, um, the east elevation, and they've also inc included the south elevation. There's no change to the south elevation. They just threw that in there for you to get an idea of what's existing. Um, but the east elevation will pretty much look like uh, brick to match. And then you'll see the cart and the vestibule entrance slightly with the tower element. If the plan commission is satisfied with these plans, there is a suggested motion that the plan commission approves the site and building plan submitted by Tom Howald of Aldi Inc. for the property at 6810 South 27th Street, subject to conditions one through four. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, questions from the commission? Christina? Actually, I have a question for Carrie. So, question, you're saying that this is part of the overlay district, and currently it's not included to use metal at the, uh, outside of the building, correct? So there's two portions of code that talk about metal panel. Um, regular code says that you can't use metal panel as a primary. Um, actually, the metal panel that's proposed is under the 25% allowance, so we're good with that but their overlay district prohibits the use of metallic materials or metallic colors. That's very specific, unfortunately. But we do have language in here that would allow the plan commission to accept what's being proposed if, if you feel that there's enough in here to compensate for that modification. So my question to you is, and probably you know about the overlay district better than me, how if we approve this today, how does this impact the rest of the businesses around here, if it does impact? We typically actually do see a lot of metal incorporated into newer buildings, even along 27th Street. In fact, one of the biggest examples that I can show you is, um, or that I can point to, is the um, proposed GMC Buick dealership on the corner of 27th and uh, Rawson. That's an all-metal panel building. That's still in the same overlay district. It's something that we're seeing. It's something that our code doesn't recognize as, you know, updated building materials. It's something that we're going to be looking at with our upcoming zoning code update. Okay. So I would say that this is going to be more in line with what we are going to be seeing. It also kind of matches the architecture that's going across the street for the new Aldi store. Yeah, so that was my concern. It's just going to impact other relating our neighborhood business in a negative way. So... It's, pr it's pretty much matching what they're going to be doing elsewhere. Okay, great. Thank you. Brian. Nothing. Vaughn? Nope. Greg? Um, no, I don't have any concerns because all they're doing really, really is updating the northwest corner of the building, correct? The entrance? I mean, the brick, addition. The brick all around is staying. Correct. There? They're adding okay. on to it. So they're going to match the brick for some of it, and then the columns will be contrasting, but... 
you're correct. It's the what's there now, except for the entry vestibule, that'll remain. Um, so it's the north and a portion of the west elevation that'll be changed. That Chris, oh, I'm good. Brad, yeah, I have a question about the handicap parking that they're yeah. eliminating. Um, did they have a provision to put that on the west? Clarification: They're not actually eliminating the handicap parking; they're just relocating. There will be an overall net decrease in their parking total of two, but they're maintaining their handicap stalls. Thank you. Crossing? No, and just my comment. Fred kind of read my mind, too. It's just I hope they're respectful, and they obviously put the handicap parking in. It's very close to the doors now. Uh, hopefully it'll remain that distance and not really have people crossing traffic patterns. Right now it's very convenient parking located so um, um, on your screen is actually the proposed location of the handicap stalls and you can see there's striping for um, that crossing right in front of the store it's currently it's right along the building yeah so this will be right in front of the new entrance okay all right um, I have nothing if everybody's satisfied uh, motion please Clark moves that the plan commission approve the site and building plans submitted by Tom Howald, Aldi Inc., for the property at 6810 South 27th Street with the following conditions. Number one, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Number two, that the plans are revised to include locations for all new, all new and relocated mechanicals, transformers, and utilities, all mechanical equipment, transformers, and utility boxes, ground, building, and rooftop shall be screened from view. Number three, that the landscape plan is revised to include the heights of plants at maturity. And number four, that all revised plans, site, building, landscaping, east elevation, etc., are submitted in digital format for review and approval by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of building permit applications. Sapert seconds. Roll call. Hannah, aye. Dunstan, aye. Perlow, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Fizikowski, aye. Sapert, aye. Chandler, aye. Uh, gets us the 5F. It's a plan review uh, for building plans. Uh, for partners in design architects for exterior modifications to an existing building on a property at 2603 West Ross and Terry again. As the mayor stated, this is for exterior modifications to the existing building. It is for the property that is highlighted in red on the screen. Now you will notice that this is on the corner of 27th and Ross and it's actually just south of where the proposed our dealership will be. This requires a little bit of history just so that everybody gets their bearings and what's being proposed versus what's there now. So this was the original report that approved the building, gives you an idea of the layout. North is Rawson Avenue. And these were the approved elevations, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but basically each of the roof elements um, are going to be maintained in some regard, but you won't see the pitched roof. And the original building materials that were approved include um, the metal coping, glass, aluminum storefront, smooth face brick, awnings, split face brick, cedar trim, siding, asphalt shingles, and scored block. The reason I draw your attention to those ex in existing exterior building materials is because what's being proposed is a bit different. And again, this is what's existing. What's being proposed are to change each of those pitched roof elements into flat roof um, elements that have a much different color pattern. So what they uh, would like to do is incorporate Nietzscheha fiber cement panels in four shades of red, two shades of gray, and a vintage wood look. The existing masonry will be kept, that will be kept will be uh, painted dark gray. Now, this will be cladding over the existing building, so they're not actually removing anything, but they're adding elements to it. As I mentioned before, the tower elements will, have, um, will be on the, on the corners and in the center, and those will have metal roofs instead of the asphalt shingles that are there now. Um, and they have incorporated metal canopies um, on the north and portions of the south elevation. It's a little bit difficult to see, but um, these are some of the proposed renderings. It gives you an idea of where the different um, 
tenants will be located. So it kind of gives you more of a breakup of that building, allowing you to see that this is a multi-tenant building, not just a single tenant building. Um, they are also proposing some um, additional signage. However, um, signs are not included in this review. There is a master sign plan for this building because it's a multi-tenant building, and that will require uh, a modification at the f in the future. So I um, need to mention again that per code, the use of fiber cement products requires a three-quarter majority approval of the Plan Commission. And we also have a requirement of 75% of the visible perimeter of the building be finished with an acceptable glass, brick, or decorative masonry material. So once again, we're being asked uh, for the Plan Commission to make a determination whether the fiber cement fulfills this requirement. Although it's not included in the plans, if there are any rooftop mechanicals, they do need to be screened or continue to be screened by these new um, facade modifications. So the towers need to still fulfill that screening um, that they have now. Um, if there are no concerns and the Plan Commission is satisfied with the proposal, there is a suggested motion that the Plan Commission approves the site and building plans submitted by Mark Molinaro, Jr., Partners in Design Architects, for the property at 2603 West Rawson Avenue, subject to conditions one through four. Mr. Mayor. I'll open it up to the commission. Jossie, start us Do off. I have questions for the applicant? Hello, my name is Paul Sterner. I'm with Partners in Design Architects in Kenosha. I reside at 4819 Fifth Avenue, Kenosha, Wisconsin. And uh, I'm Aaron Stanton, and I'm employed by the uh, property owner. Uh, so I'm just representing him here tonight. Can you provide a little more information on why the change has happened? Uh, the building is pretty dated. Um, there's a lot of gable um, and country style. Um, uh, I guess uh, details on the exterior of the building it's very long and narrow uh, one time there was just a single use uh, user for that building and um, we recognize the need to uh, bring the, the building to a more modern look and, uh, so we've tried to use uh, some materials in a design style that would um, bring it to a current uh, you know a modern uh, I guess appearance now do you have samples Just go through them on the mic. We can record the details. So one of the design concepts um, we had selected, we wanted to stay within a palette, not try to get too crazy with different colors. That seems to be kind of common. So we picked a red palette that was kind of, uh, the idea was a, of a weathered barn look. So in, a, in an abstract way. Of course, it's a contemporary building. So it's kind of a, a large change between a very traditional uh, peaked roof to a more uh, slightly sloped and then addressing each of the elements uh, with the red. Overall we have then the uh, wood panel uh, cement fiberboard and, and on top of each of those sections we're adding uh, awning so we have some shading. Um, trying to improve the overall appearance for uh, the number of tenants, they just had a couple uh, at a dentist, an orthodontist recently, um, who are very interested in, in trying to upgrade the facade for their business. Mm -hmm. And I have a question for Carrie. I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. There is the information in this packet saying they want a larger monument sign, but we will address that later, correct? Yes, signage okay. is not part of this review at all. Thank you. Is that it? Okay. Uh, Fred's still thinking? Still thinking. That's okay. We can come <laughs> on back. Um, Chris, anything? You ready? Well, I think uh, the theme you know, going on tonight is uh, ref uh, refresh and regroup or whatever you want to call it, but I really think that this is a, a nice look for this building. and I think it's a, a welcome change. You know? Uh, I agree. I just had a question for Carrie, um, especially the location of this is on intersect major intersection of Austin and 27th Street. Has there been a public information meeting for this? This or is the public report? information meeting. Oh, so this is considered public information. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, the building is existing, so anybody within 300 feet of the existing building would have received notice of tonight's meeting. Okay, with the changes in the colors, because I agree with you, it's dated, so it seems to be a refresher. However, it may impact other businesses or neighboring, especially Franklin across the street. So it would be good if you could know about that. Yep. Like you said, if they yep. have been notified, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Brian? Nothing for me. Nothing? Dawn? Oh, nothing for me. I do like it, though. Greg? I would just echo what's already been said. It's a huge improvement. Um, no offense to the designer of the first building or existing tenants, but I drive by, by there so often, and it really goes unnoticed. So hopefully this will draw people's eye and bring more traffic into that building. And I'd, I'd echo the same thing. Uh, I've been by, you know, that, that building's 20-plus years old. Uh, it was a fine-looking building in its day, but things have changed. If I was going to put a business in, I'd want an exciting uh, feel to it. I mean, not just for your customers, but for the employees, too. Um, and I think this, this helps. And to tell you the truth, you're going to help that whole area. Uh, Christine, you brought up about notifying people. Uh, many of the homes are for sale along Rawson Avenue. There's some homes across the street. Uh, we do have a dealership going in across the way, and, and think this will help set the tone for that corner too because uh, it is kind of a gateway so um, I'm happy with it so. I just have one yeah, question yep. go ahead Fred <laughs> about signage on the north elevation Are, is there going to be any signage telling what's signage that you submit the signage that we're proposing and we will we, we will present that in a separate um, application um, is basic uh, clad to the building with maybe some down light. Uh, so there is some, some signage on the north side of the building, and it will be based on tenant usage. Um, one important thing to note, um, it, it used to be like a single-use building, and so what we're doing is our plan is um, we, we have very limited or low occupancy right now in that building, or, and so there's a lot of vacant space. So we're, we're trying to um, create a, an environment where the, the suites are front to back, so south being the front entrance, um, but then it would travel straight through to the back, the north side, so creating um, mm -hmm. suites that are um, kind of line up with that signage. Out of the hall down the way. Actually, the it's very out. similar to what you have at Drexel Town Square. All the entrances face the interior right. of yep. Town Square. And you see some samples of the signs on... Uh... Hey, ma'am, if you want to speak, you'll have to come to the podium. Come on, no, oh, oh, come on. To see the you colors. want to see the colors? Oh, oh, okay. Want to get it? Oh, I thought you wanted to make a statement. Sorry about that. Oh, oh. So the signage that we're showing in some of these images are are very. They're pretty bland, so they're not really. We're not trying to allow the, the tenants to put these big, huge neon signs everywhere. We want to be really classy. Uh, yeah, Pete, Pete puts a lid on that anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't hear that one. <laughs> right, Pete? Never mind. <laughs> um, no, when it comes to the signage, it would be individual. So um, depending on what they got in there, uh, nail salon, spa, they recently put two new signs up, one for um, pediatric dentistry mm -hmm. and an orthodontics uh, tenant. They both have channel letter with the raceway matching the, the color of the, of the building. So um, <clears throat> as the applicant said, there'll have to be a master plan. Uh, since it was a single tenant at the time of the building being approved, they never submitted a master sign plan. They're working with the sign company right now to work on that. So more than likely, you're going to probably see channel lettering similar to what you see in other multi-tenant buildings located in the city. Um, would there ever be a monument sign there? Because they're a little bit close to uh, Rawson. There are two monument signs. Which, are there really? Yes. And I go by there all the time. And eh? there's only should be one. So, so I'd have to look into the – I noticed it just recently when I was Sorry driving that, by. Guys. <laughs> but uh, there is monument sign with the – the expansion of the intersection over there, they lost some real estate along Rawson Avenue. So whatever they do propose, they're going to have to meet the current sign code of 10 feet away, no taller than 8 feet tall. And I've been working with their sign company, so 
I don't foresee any problems with it, but if they do uh, exceed the rules and regulations, they probably will be applying for a sign appeal and explaining the hardship as to why they need a sign that doesn't conform. Okay, thank you for that, Pete. Uh, again, you know, we're seeing a lot of this, but you know, sometimes we see brand new buildings, and that's always exciting. But to really see the reinvestment in some older properties, it's really encouraging that uh, what's going on here is bringing up other building values. Along so thanks for you guys for bringing it forward. So, uh, Fred, anything? No, I'm fine. That takes Okay. Um, nothing else. Motion. Seifert moves that the plan commission approve the site and building plans <coughs> submitted by Mark Marinero, Jr., Partners in Design uh, Architects for the property at 2603 West Rawson Avenue with the following conditions. One, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Two, that the master sign plan is updated and submitted for plan commission review and approval prior to the submission of signed permit applications for any tenant. Three, that all mechanical equipment, transformers and utility boxes, ground build, building and rooftops are screened from view. And four, that all revised plans, site building and landscaping, east elevation and so forth are submitted in digital form, format, I'm sorry, for review and approval by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of building permit application. Chandler, second. Um, before I call the roll call, you kind of answered my question. I, I forgot to ask it about landscape, but it's covered in the condition. There's really no landscaping changes that will need to occur until we talk about the signage for the monument sign, but as far as what's there now, it'll be what's existing. If anything is I changed, guess, then... Yeah, my question was, you guys going to pull some of that stuff out? Oh, yeah. I was going to say it's... Yeah, we're going to clean it up real nice. Yeah, you don't want to hide that beautiful facade behind those. So those you want to take a look at the existing landscaping plan that's on on file for that was approved by the plan commission and use that as a guide and we can talk about what needs to happen right thank you sorry for the distraction <clears throat> uh roll call please Hannah, i johnston i Perlo, i lorik i kavich i kuzikowski i super i chandler i and our final item of the night 5g is a rezone uh, requested by cs milwaukee llc levitt properties to rezone the property at 135 West Forest Hill from B3 Office and Professional Business to M1 Manufacturing. Harry? So what we are talking about is the property that's on the screen. Plan commissioners will note that the, the building that's existing on the property actually crosses property boundaries. So um, the proposal is to rezone what's highlighted in red from B3 to M1. Um, when the when the building was approved in 2001 for Northern Computers, um, there, was, there was an allowance for the warehouse facility. The warehouse portion of the building is, was restricted to M1. However, when the property was uh, leased to Masterlock, um, the computer lab portion of the building was allowed to change to a warehouse function. Unfortunately, there was a little bit of uh, process error, or oversight rather, there should have been an amendment to the approval and the zoning district at that time. So what we're doing right now is actually correcting um, an error and recognizing what the historic and current use of the building is and will be. Um, both properties, 135 and 195, will actually be sold together, so there's no issue with that. Um, a CSM will be forthcoming to join those two properties, so we'll actually have an elimination of uh, an issue there. Um, we are also anticipating a comprehensive plan amendment in the future, either through the regular update process or it may come sooner. So the comprehensive plan currently shows planned mixed use around the Drexel Town Square area and planned, two planned industrials south of West Forest Hill Avenue, and then planned office along um, Howell Avenue itself. Zoning in the area, you have a mixed-use zoning district around DTS, light manufacturing south of DTS to Zoond, manufacturing, which is south and west of Drexeltown Square, 
an office in professional business and highway business, which is east of da uh, Drexeltown Square to Howell Avenue. There's also a mix of RD1, which is two-family residential, B1, which is local business, and RS3, which is single-family residential zoning districts and uses located immediately across Howell Avenue. So that gives you an idea of the mix of uses that exists in this area already. There is a suggested motion that if the plan commission is um, of the same mindset that the property should be rezoned. There is a motion that the plan commission recommends to the common council that the property at 135 West Forest Hill Avenue be rezoned from B3 Office and Professional Business District to M1 Manufacturing District after a public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Gary. Uh, questions from the commission? Christina? Brian? Don? Greg? Okay, got something. Chris? Nothing for me. Fred? Yeah, I'd like to know what type of manufacturing they're talking about, light manufacturing. With or, this? I with think it's this. just a rezone to get it there for the the, um, I, the realtor to, to have the option. So it's under one zone. So uh, I don't envision heavy manufacturing, probably a use similar to whatever Master Lodge did with it. The existing building allows for, it's set up so that the front portion is all office. Um, and then the back portion is more like flex warehouse space. Final pass. Uh, you got okay. it. No, you uh, I you can give it to Carrie. Yeah. Okay. My name is Ann Lampy. I live at 8436 South Howell Avenue. And I remember before Northern Computers was built, Target was actually supposed to go there. And we stopped Target from going there because they were violating the rules regarding TIF districts, ironically. And that's how Target ended up where it was. And that's how we got that beautiful Northern Computers building because they went in a TIF district and they were allowed under that usage. Now, if the comprehensive plan now says that it should be office along Howell Avenue, then I think you should keep it office along Howell Avenue and not just change the comprehensive plan because someone wants it to be manufacturing. Those are offices along Howell Avenue. And if you give them an M1 zoning, they can put in anything that's allowed under M1 zoning. And if you've looked at that list, it is extensive. That doesn't mean it will stay office at the front. They can change that to something else. And it will be M1 zoning. That is a beautiful building. And they're maintaining it as a beautiful building as they try to sell it. So the idea that you have to do this so that it's not a vacant building it doesn't matter. They're going to keep it maintained to sell it. And you need to maintain the property tax base at its best. You change this to manufacturing, it goes under a different basis for valuation, and you're losing tax money by making this whole thing M1. You could do a split zoning on there. Split zoning's been done before. Keep that front part office if that's what they really mean to do. And just say manufacturing with what is designed for that. We live across the street. We want it to stay looking the way it looks. We don't, <laughs> Master Lock was incentivized to go into a new building. And we would, we would like the use to maintain an office use at that corner. It's, it's a big corner in the city. And if you want redevelopment to happen behind it, which will happen, then you need to keep that reflecting what you want to come instead of what can only go there. Okay. I'd like to see what's behind that to, to change to something else. It's, there's beautiful buildings uh, in Drexel Town Square and adjacent to it. Let's keep spreading that rather than changing it to M1. So that is my request, that you you consider what's good for all of us instead of what just makes it easier for the people trying to sell the building. And thank you, Commissioner Seepert, for asking this. According to this report, it's for an undisclosed manufacturing. So I think they know, they just don't want to say, and that makes me nervous, and I think it makes you nervous as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Hey, look at that, zero. <laughs> Does that thing, do we even use that thing? <laughs> oh, it was. 
Uh, Kevin Lampe, 8436 South Hall. I'll just highlight two things. Um, it's currently zoned business in that front area. Keep it that way and split the, the other portion of the building that's a uh, warehouse. Maybe it's even manufacturing as it stands now, but uh, that would be the only thing I'd like to uh, repeat of what Ann mentioned earlier. Split, split the, uh, the zoning where the, where the current uh, warehousing area is and keep the front uh, business which it's currently zoned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, you know, uh, it's kind of been discussed internally. Uh, we'd like to keep, instead of split zoning or spot zoning, we like to keep it all one way. Uh, again, through conditions and restrictions, uh, I think we can regulate some of what goes in there. I agree with you. It is a beautiful building. It's probably one of the nicest buildings within the city, without a doubt. It's not to say that a manufacturer would come in and take manufacturing up right to the front. So, um, I, you know, I think it's appropriate to bring it to the M1 zoning with the rest of it. Which, um, as Kerry said, it was somewhat of an oversight back in the early 2000s or whenever it was done for the computer company or the or the master lock. One of the master two. lock. It was when master lock went in. Right, and it's and it's just really unfortunate. Master lock actually outgrew the building. Fortunate they took over the old Caterpillar site, but. Uh, uh, I think we do. I think we should put it back to M1. Again, I think we can still protect the integrity of the building and and the frontage of Hall Avenue with it what it is. Um, I mean, if if I had it my way, I'd turn it into a convention center. But I don't have millions upon millions of dollars to do that. But it is it's a beautiful. Awful, yeah. It is a beautiful <laughs> building. Uh, the facade, I think, is just yeah. dynamite. So. Um, questions. Uh, I got everybody, but uh, I do Chelsea. have a question for the applicant. The applicant. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> I'm Mike Wanizek with Colliers International. I'm the uh, listing agent uh, for the building and also the property manager for the building. So, thank you. We have been maintaining it well for the, uh, for the past year, and uh, we look to continue to do that. And that was my question. Can you provide a little more information on possible use if there's a potential manufacturing company? Will it be office area manufacturing? Or is, there, is that information? Can I, you disclose that I can't disclose who the um, potential buyer is. Um, what I can tell you is that their interest in the building is because of its current layout uh, and because of all the office that Master Lock already built out. Um, they plan to use the vast majority, if not all of that, um, for office use. I think everyone's going to be very excited in a few weeks um, and we'll be able to disclose. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to say a comment. Um, it's just a comment, not really. Unless we're able to add to restrictions, to modify it from, like rezone it from business to, to M1, I'm not sure if we can do that. I'm kind of proposing it, taking from what you just said, Dan. Um, well, we will have the conditions and restrictions on a normal M1. They so won't be treated any differently. The M1 zoning district has a list of allowed uses. And it has um, it's split between permitted and conditional. If what is to come in were to require a conditional use permit, we would have greater uh, control over conditions and restrictions for that use. Otherwise, it would be required to comply with the existing code as currently written. It's hard to say exactly what the conditions would be unless there is a conditional use permit that's been provided. And there hasn't been. Question unknown. Anything that's allowed in the M1 district. But currently, most of it. But the, building, the building itself lends to a certain kind of user. It, exactly. So it is, it is set up for office use with like an office slash, um, oh, I'm sorry, like a warehousing type of component. component. Um, it used to be a computer lab. So uh, it's... It's not set up for like freight terminal kind of things. It's more set up for light manufacturing. 
that's how the building is laid out now. The building, if you've ever been in the building itself, it, it's not, it, it wasn't built like AC Delco was in the day with the heavy beams. I mean, it's more of a warehouse structure like you see typically in the spec buildings that are going up nowadays that we tip up, um, you know, and they, they rent space to like an OP house and things like that. I guess what I'm trying to understand before making any decision, what, like, especially hearing the concern about the, the building and will that uh, um, purchaser or the buyer are able to modify anything outside to impact that and also traffic because you know that there is quite a bit of business on the other side. How is this going to impact modifying into M1? So any exterior building modifications, any changes to the site itself, that would have to come back before the plan commission. So anything that they want to do on the property is still under city jur jurisdiction. So it, like I said, if they want to change any component of the building, they want to change any portion of the site, that has to come back for review. So we do have, we, we do have the ability at that time to add conditions of approval, restrictions, if necessary. How about increasing that, especially if you modified to M1, there should be some sort of a truck percentage increase, sort of, not freight, but we would have to take a look at whatever the proposal is, and if it's determined based on what they are proposing and code needs to have additional scrutiny, it will come back before this commission. Okay. Anyone else? I'd just like, again, to express my opinion. I would like to see it stay the way it is. I'm sorry. I'm afraid that once you open up to manufacturing, could create some problems, and I don't think manufacturing is really necessary along Hall Avenue. Okay. If I can ask a question of the representative, is it possible for you to uh, give not necessarily what the business is or what the business does, but kind of an idea of what the end tenants you're looking to attract are? So in other words, are we looking for the building to be occupied like another master, master lock tenant? It's very similar. I'm sorry, yeah. the microphones are kind of <laughs> not picking up very well today. The existing use of the building is the main attraction um, for this buyer. They looked all throughout um, southeast Wisconsin. This building and the layout is one of the things that attracted it to it. Um, where it's separated between the two parcels is in the middle of the current manufacturing space. If you walked in there, it's not like it's cut off at the office portion or it's cut off at a, at a clean line. It's cut off literally right in the middle of what's currently used by Honeywell um, for light manufacturing uh, in storage space today. So we're only looking to have it match what Honeywell, who's currently in the building, is doing and what master lock previously did and what this buyer wants to do for the building the vast majority of their jobs are, uh, are high paying and their uh, office use jobs um, they're not manufacturing jobs and last word <laughs> <laughs> if that is true then they should be fine with the split zoning the office stays office, and the part that's used for manufacturing that is currently zoned office becomes manufacturing. And I know, okay, that the city does, oh, you're trying to get away from split zoning. This is a unique example that they're already under split zoning. You're just accommodating what they're saying they want, but protecting the integrity of that building. Once again, from our st staff's perspective, it wasn't correct in the first place. So two well, wrongs don't was make it, a right. Or did they just use it the way it was? And now we're going to make it what they were using that they just did. Okay? Right. It's, if they made a mistake, correct it to what it should be. And that's and office in the front and manufacturing in the back. The mistake that was made was that in the first place. So... They split the zoning and we're trying to get away they, from There's that, other so. places in this city with split zoning. I know because we did them. And, and again, we're going to probably correct them along the way too. Well, and then <laughs> you'll be making a mistake because this reflects what he says he wants, protects the people, protects the building, because even though you say it has to come before the city, 
If it is allowed under M1, it's allowed. And if they meet the code as far as setbacks, it's allowed. And all you have control of is what the finish of the building is, not what they do to their property. That's property rights. So you want to keep it what it is? Then only give them what they say they're asking for. And if it turns out that works, they can come back again. But they're able to sell the building. And you get what you want. And you're not giving up the value of that office to M1. Thank you. Again, um, we are looking to make a correction, as Carrie stated earlier, of something that was overlooked years ago. Um, so with that, we'll ask for a moment. Mr. Mayor, I think there's a little bit of a confusion here too. Um, it's two separate parcels and the zoning district line actually is on the parcel line. So the split zoning is actually for the building, which is more of a problem for staff when it comes to trying to um, enforce the rules with regard to the building itself because you have a building that crosses district lines and property lines. So the, the CSM to find the properties and it, is going to solve one that, issue. That was my next question, because the CSM will have to be combined. Yeah, that'll solve combined. one issue. And then the rezone portion, which is before you this evening as a consideration, <laughs> will solve the other concern, which is uh, the use of the building, which was restricted at, in 2001, and was allowed to change that computer lab portion for Northern Computers when Masterlock and Honeywell went in, that became more of the uh, parts assembly and warehouse um, storage function. And the zoning didn't change at that time because that was the oversight. So the building component, the usage of the building is not being proposed to change at this time. It's proposed to reflect the use of the building as was for Master Lock and Honeywell. Actually, really odd the parcel never got combined in the first place. Yes, the history of these two parcels is interesting. Um, it, Northern Computers originally looked at the parcel immediately to the north, and then they came back, and there's a whole history of review for these this area for that um, proposal. So... But the existing building, if there were, again, if there were any changes to the building, to the use, we would still have some options to look at what's being proposed on that property um, in terms of usage and also site, because there is stormwater uh, infrastructure that affects that property as well. So we would be looking at, we would be looking at that very closely. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, uh, motion. Clerk moves that the plan commission recommend to the common council that the property at 135 West Forest Hill Avenue be rezoned from B3 Office and Professional Business District to M1 Manufacturing District after a public hearing. Regent Kelskill second. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnson, aye. Hello, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Regent aye. Deepert, no. Chandler, aye. Okay, there you have it. Um, adjournment. We are up for adjournment. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, there's actually one more oh, item to consider, and that's whether or that, not we want to cancel the uh, January 22nd meeting. You are right. I did see the email. So uh, is everybody clear on that? Um, it, there was an email that Yeah, that we went haven't out. received any applications to be reviewed at the January 22nd meeting. So if there's no business to be conducted, um, it's up for discussion whether the plan commission wishes to meet or to cancel that meeting. So, seeing as we have nothing on the docket, you can give yourself a unless rare anybody Tuesday has anything else that we can. We still have time to put together an agenda. You know, uh, but as of right now, if you have no applications, we have no applications. We would need a motion time. to suspend the January twenty second meeting. Cancel, not suspend. I make the motion. I'll second. Roll call. Anna, aye. Dunstan, aye. Grillo, aye. Lorik, aye. David, aye. Rizikowski, aye. Stapert, aye. Chandler, aye. All right. Motion to adjourn. Carrillo moves to adjourn at 727. Stapert seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Dunstan, aye. Grillo, aye. Lorik, aye. David, aye. Rizikowski, aye. Stapert, aye. Chandler, aye. 